Oh, we start so, shall we? Mm -hmm. So, good evening in Australia and welcome to all participants to the Ramford Expert Webinar Series. My name is Manfred Tauber and I am Head of Global Education at Renford. Today, I would like to welcome Xavi Han from Perth, Western Australia. In Perth, he runs his own laboratory, Hunt Dental, since last year. He started his career in Europe, in Hungary, in Hungary with the degree of a Master Dental Technician in 2004. Xavi Han is a well-experienced dental ceramist and also an excellent photographer. He is a speaker at international congresses and course lecturer since more than 10 years. With this web webinar, Xavi Hunt presents anterior layering from wax to ceramic. So now I look forward to an exciting presentation and hand over to you, Xavi. Thank you, Manfred. Um, welcome everyone. And uh, thank you, Manfred, for inviting me and also thank you for Ramford. So today I'd like to show you um, wax and ceramic. So how you can use wax to learn morphology and also layering. And uh, wax is great because wax is actually much cheaper than, than uh, using ceramic. So let me start my presentation. So please, Ramford, let me know if everything is going well. Okay. So we can go to the next slide actually so this is the topic for today um, i'm going to talk about wax up and and ceramic i'm a ceramist for probably over 20 years it's um, really uh, amazing how time flies and so i learned a lot about uh, ceramic and i can get some acceptable and nice results nowadays but um, you know, ceramic is not easy to learn because you have to fire, you build up a powder and, a, and a, a liquid mixture. So it's a little bit unpredictable and, and hard to, um, you know, plan what's going to be the result. So that's why I think wax is an excellent uh, material for, for testing and, and also learning morphology and layering. So in this presentation, I, I want to share with you uh, these steps in the wax and also the ceramic. So sharing some tips and tricks um, about ceramic firing. Uh, but um, I always say that um, I'm always um, happy to answer any questions after the course. So you will find my uh, contact details. And if you have any uh, unanswered uh, questions, just please contact me uh, and I'm always happy to help. So just shortly about um, my background. So as Manfred mentioned, I'm from Hungary. So I grew up there and I studied uh, um, in my hometown. And that, that young person, that's me uh, back then, 20 years ago. So amazing how <laughs> time flies. Um, so I moved to Australia with my family in 2010. So we moved to Perth, Western Australia. And we really enjoyed the life here. So it's a beautiful country and Perth is, uh, is really good for families. Uh, I'm a member of uh, the Renford family and also Ivoclar. Um, in last year, I opened my um, lab at home. So this was my, my dream for a long time because uh, I'm always working long hours. So uh, even if I'm in the lab, I'm really close to the family. So that's really nice uh, for me and hopefully for them as well. So what I always recommend is uh, use your mentor, um, nature as your mentor, because um, we, we just copy uh, nature or try to copy and try to imitate. So if you have any chance to, to get access for um, natural uh, dentition, so extracted teeth, or you have some nice uh, impressions, um, just make sure you have some uh, models and keep those models close by, because you can learn more about uh, morphology from the from the natural dentition. And if you have any kind of resin, it can be a, a dental resin, it can be um, an art resin, so from an art shop, uh, you can duplicate this natural uh, extracted teeth 
and um, duplicate with the resin. And you can see on the resin that how nicely it's replicate all the details. So it's not just uh, the texture, it's not just the shape, but also the luster from the, the natural dentition. So for me, it's a really amazing tool. Um, so and it's much more durable and you can use for analyzing and, and studying morphology. So here's another other example with, uh, with resin model. And you can see all the details are there. So it's a young patient. You can see the vertical grooves, horizontal grooves, perichiamatas, so everything is there. Um, and I think resin is much better than stone uh, because stone can't replicate these fine details. So if you have a chance, um, just give it a try and, and pour up some um, impressions with resin. Okay, so first I'd like to talk about the difficulties um, with restorations um, because you can learn layering, um, but actually what to use for the layering is quite critical. And I learned from my mistakes, uh, or hopefully I'm learning from my mistakes. And I want to show you what those mistakes and what's, uh, what is the issue uh, when you do layering and creating any kind of restoration. So this is my first uh, porcelain fused to metal bridge um, and I only used enamel and dentin. And in theory, that should be enough because in a natural dentition you have dentin and enamel only. So why not just use that? Uh, the problem is nature is much more complicated than uh, the ceramic we, uh, we use. So ceramic can't replicate uh, easily the natural dentition or what you see in the mouth. So that's why we have to learn how to modify our layerings and what kind of materials to use. So the I think the most um, important aspect of a restoration is the, the opacity and the value. So if the value of the restoration is not correct, uh, it's going to stand out and probably the patient and also the dentist not going to accept your work. So when it was a long process for me to learn, you know, what's the, the critical factors and you can see all the mistakes here. So this is um, an Emacs crown and I spent hours to create a nice shape and texture using silver powder, uh, but still, you know, it was short in the mouth and also the, I think the, um, what you normally hear with Emacs restorations, that it was gray, so low in value. So I quickly learned I have to focus on, on the value and, uh, and try to create a little bit higher value, more opaque restorations. And this is not easy or um, it wasn't easy with uh, Emacs Ceram and Emacs um, restorations because at the beginning Emacs was designed for a high opacity and bright framework. So if you use the Emacs on a wide framework, your restorations look good. But then um, as um, new materials, new pressing modes, new uh, translucency cornea frameworks um, came to the market, um, Emacs Ceram, the original Emacs Ceram was to translucent and the restorations uh, turned to um, low in value or the re end result was low in value when you insert it into the mouth. So I started to focus on, on opacity and value and this is an excellent um, you know, case for uh, demonstrate that even with uh, a translucent framework um, an old ceramic restoration, you can block out a really dark stump shade. But so how can you achieve this one? Uh, you can use a really opaque framework, but the problem with that one is that the framework is opaque from the cervical uh, to the incisal edge, and that's not ideal for an old ceramic restoration. So um, instead of using an opaque framework, I decided to use an MO or LT or even sometimes a, an MT framework, which is more translucent, and using um, an ivory color white stain to opaque basically or mask uh, the discoloration underneath. So here you can see on the left side, I have only one layer of white stain and that red mark inside the crown is coming through. So uh, obviously one layer of white stain is not enough to uh, block out the discoloration. But if I apply three layers of white stain, so in different uh, firings, then you can see it's nicely blocking uh, uh, the, the dark stump shade. So here's another example. Uh, you can see the, the uh, right central of the patient is really dark and it's an old ceramic restoration, an LT framework, which is like a dentine translucency. 
um, and I use this white masking technique and uh, end result I think is pretty good so nicely blocking out the discoloration. Here is another example and uh, I like to um, talk about the trines because in my point of view uh, trines are really important to to save time for the technician and for the dentist as well. It's an extra appointment but uh, with this step you can make sure that the final result is is um, close as possible to the natural one and there is no disappointment that uh, you have to send back the, the case to the technician so uh, the patient is know what to expect. So normally uh, we try in with uh, Dr. Tony Rotondo after the first fire so I can see if the opacity of my restoration is correct or not so this area is the high value most opaque area so I can check um, and I can easily modify if it's necessary. So here's the final or finalized case on uh, wax models. So I like to make these wax models because I can check um, the masking and also I can see nicely the shape on the wax. So you can use easily um, a denting color wax and also pink wax to make these uh, uh, models. And here's the final result. So you can see uh, the match is really nice and close. The tissue profile uh, wasn't um, the same as on the other side. But this was when the when Tony uh, inserted the crown, so hopefully after that it's gonna um, have a similar shape like the other side. Here is another case uh, with high opacity, and again um, the reason I, I show because uh, don't be afraid to mix different powders together. So if you think that the powder you use is not opaque enough or not bright enough, uh, just feel. Um, you know, free to mix some white stain or, or white ceramic powders and, and experience. So with experience you can, you can get much better results. But with wax this is much easier. So first talk about the internal anatomy of the, the teeth so to understand uh, the layerings and what uh, we have to do. So here's a, a cross section of the natural uh, centrals and you can see the enamel and dentin core. So the enamel is usually around 0.31 millimeter thick. It depends on which area. And uh, that's what you uh, replicate with uh, translucent ceramics. But sometimes uh, the preparation is still in enamel. So uh, many times we don't have um, that much of thickness like in a natural dentition. So we only have, for example, 0.7 millimeter room to create a natural um, restoration. So that's why you have to learn how to modify your layering and how to apply the different materials. So I sacrificed this um, nice central and I removed the enamel just to see the internal denting core. So here you can see the difference and uh, the thickness of the original enamel. And um, so it's much easier to understand when you're building up a crown or the veneer how you need to create uh, the internal structure. So I'm using a really similar design uh, for the, um, the framework as well. So basically replicating the denting core. Uh, obviously it depends on the case. So if it's a thin veneer case, usually I don't have that much room. But this is a crown case and I have a room to create a nice internal core similar to the denting. So here's uh, on the uh, right side you can see the uh, the dentin core only and you can see the dentin is not just opaque it's also uh, translucent especially where it's really thin so this area is quite thin and and hollow from the uh, lingual side or the palatal side so that's why it's translucent so we have translucency in the dentin not just in the uh, enamel so when you're increasing the contrast in an image you can see more details and you can um, just uh, create a stronger border lines between the different areas. So here you can see a high opacity area. So this is the, the thickest part of the, the teeth. And uh, that's why it's really opaque because it's reflecting back a lot of light. And uh, the translucent area is just letting through the light, uh, more light uh, goes through. And that's why it looks more translucent. Um, so what is interesting uh, when I analyze my cases, I find this pattern. So I'm not sure if it's clear here, but uh, on the left side you have the normal polarized photograph and on the right side you can see the high contrast image. 
Um, and you can see this pattern that you have this really high opacity core um, around the, uh, the cervical, the body area, and the contrast is quite big to the uh, incisal area. So uh, we have to create this contrast in the restoration, otherwise the result is not going to be natural. So I'm sure you heard this um, saying before that the picture is worth a thousand words um, and it's really true. So nothing is better for communication than a photograph. Um, so you can make draw drawings and um, that's how I started. So I draw down my, my layering maps and the details, but in a photograph, you just have much more details. So I highly encourage uh, everyone to uh, invest in a camera setup. Um, so if your budget is low, then you can buy some secondhand cameras. So if something is like five or 10 years old, uh, they're still uh, really good and really amazing for dental photography. So in Australia, roughly around $1,000 or um, maybe 1200 you can have a full setup and, and that camera will serve you for many, many years. So you can easily use a camera for five and 10 years. So if you're interested in photography, these are the settings that I normally recommend. Um, I personally prefer a manual flash because that's much more a control for me. Uh, but if you, if you are experienced or just a beginner, you can use a, a TTL uh, flash setup, which is uh, through the lens, so a semi-automatic uh, flash setup, and uh, you can easily take nice photographs with that one. So here's an example, um, a really uh, nice uh, natural, so it's all natural uh, dentition here. Um, and you can capture with the photograph much more details that, uh, than with, you, with drawings. But this is my opinion, so maybe you believe in drawings, but I like to take photos. It's just, for me, it's much more uh, rich in details. So this is a polarized photograph. So with a polarized photograph, you can eliminate all the reflections from the surface. If I go back, you can see the difference. So for the first look, it looks a little bit uh, flat or less contrasty. But once you increase the contrast in the image, you can see really nicely all the details inside. And that's really helpful uh, when you're creating an restoration to uh, copy these details internally. So when you have the photographs, somehow you can analyze. So you can just look at and uh, the increased contrast and, and try to find different details. But what I recommend is to use some kind of uh, tool or some kind of software to analyze the photographs and measure the different values. And on Mac computers, um, this is a free and built-in. It's called a digital color meter. So it's basically, um, you can measure the values on the photographs easily and also you can measure the different colors. So it's uh, free on Mac and I'm sure on Windows you can find similar softwares. And with those softwares, it's much easier to analyze your photographs. So when I analyze my photos, I create uh, a shade map um, because at the beginning I, I've done drawings about my layerings and it's, it's always really helpful, especially when you do a case and couple of months later when you see the final result and you see that it wasn't correct or it looks actually really nice, you can go back to your um, layering map, your shade map, and you can uh, check um, you know, what you've done with the layerings and you can learn a lot from this one. So I moved to digital and um, so this digital shade map is um, quite simple. I have these different sections or different parts. Um, but I use normally 90% of my cases, so I found this, these are the main parts of my layering. So, and the files are stored in, um, or the, the shade map file stored with the photograph, so I, it's, I can always find the photos easily later. So here's um, a case, um, so I call the, uh, the, uh, the patient John Bramford, so that's the case where I layered for this presentation. And so this is my uh, digital shade map. So you can see the parts here, you can rename them, you can move them and I have some extra different bits um, if you wanna add cracks or different uh, details. So now start the, um, the main reason of the presentation. So layering wax um, against the ceramic so, or compared to the ceramic. So this is the, the waxed up framework for the, uh, the pressing. 
And um, so I used um, this really nice wax kit uh, from Ramford, which is designed with August Bruguera. And um, so if you have a chance, um, just watch August's uh, presentation. He's, his presentation was um, yesterday, I think, or day before yesterday. So really amazing. Um, his talent is, and knowledge is, is huge. So I highly recommend to watch his uh, presentation. And so this is the kit I use. And I always um, encourage everyone to use different colors. So it's, it's really up to you what you want to use. Um, the kit is excellent for start, but you can add your own colors if you want. So here's the two, um, you know, frameworks or startups. So on the left side, it's a PMMA die. And here I have the LTBL free framework. So I prepared the, the framework with stain um, and I sprinkled uh, Animax add-on ceramic powder. So I, I like to use the add-on powder because it's fused to the surface much better than the normal dentin. And um, so that's just my, my theory, but I found this quite helpful to avoid any kind of peeling uh, from the, the margin. So first I'd like to show you how I layer the wax. Um, so the first, um, layer is the, the dentin, the pure dentin in the, the Bruguer kit. And what I found that the dentin is much more opaque than uh, like Emacs Ceram. So that's why I mixed the dentin with some enamel. But here, what you see, it's probably hard to see because it's a really small amount. But I added some um, pure dentin here to have that really high opacity and high value uh, area. So the next one is um, uh, a dentin, an orange wax, because usually at the cervical area and the proximal area, you have much more chroma. It's usually coming from the root and uh, from the gingiva, but with some um, orange wax, we can um, imitate that one. The next layer is dentin and animal um, mixture. Um, the two wax are mixed together because I found that the dentin is just a little bit too opaque for this area. So I use that um, wax to build up um, the mammalons. So this is the, the internal structure of the mammalon of the dentin. So here it's a little bit thick still uh, on this image, but on the next slide you can see I, I thin down because if you leave that thick, um, it's create more reflection and uh, the overall appearance is gonna be a little bit more opaque. So it's important with wax and it's also important with the ceramic. So if we compare to the, the natural uh, teeth, the etched teeth, so you can see here the internal mammals. So that's what I try to create uh, with wax. So the next step is to build up the, the translucent area. For this one, you can use um, a blue wax, you can mix the blue wax with enamel if you find that one is too strong, or you can add more blue. So it's it's really up to you. Um, what I recommend is to find a nice photograph and try to copy that one in the wax. So you can see I built up uh, the wax around the dentin, um, and you have to be careful because if you melt the dentin wax to the blue, the, um, uh, the transition gonna be different. So it obviously depends on the case, but that's what I used. Um, here I use some enamel because I try to avoid a too homogeneous um, uh, bluish translucency. So I, I broke up with this enamel here. So basically that creates some um, contrast in the, in the translucent area. So again, so this is what I try to replicate. Um, this is a polarized photograph. So this is the flash. So it's a little bit different, but it's close, I, I guess. Okay, so the next uh, slide, so you can see the, the mammalons. Um, so I put some mammalons there with the dentin. I also mix dentin with orange wax and the dentin with uh, pink wax or uh, red wax. So to create some pinkish um, mammalons. Um, again, it depends on the case, but you can see here just the different colors. It's creates some, um, you know, similar illusion what you find in natural uh, dentition. So here I created this absorption area. So um, I read about this um, kind of material or, or area in the tool from uh, Gerard Bassi in his book. So basically, 
uh, because we're imitating nature, sometimes we have to use colors to imitate translucency. So obviously the, the framework I use, the PMMA framework is, um, you know, it's just too opaque and it's not translucent enough to uh, look through the dentine and, um, and the wax. So that's why I use some um, violet gray wax here to imitate translucency. So finalizing uh, the memelons uh, with carvings, so just make them a little bit um, sharper and, and similar to what you see in a natural uh, teeth. So here what you see is the dentine halo. So the halo appears in a natural dentition um, um, because the enamel is thick and it's non-homogeneous. Um, so with uh, many prisms and water inside. So, but in the ceramic and wax, we can't imitate uh, by just building up. So we have to imitate with different opacity levels. So that's why I used uh, dentin, and it's really similar with ceramic. Uh, in ceramic, I using I'm using a, a power dentin to imitate. Um, this halo effect. So here I'm using some whitish enamel. So many times because the, the enamel is a little bit thicker on the line angles, it creates some um, brighter results or brighter appearance. So that's why I mix the enamel with a white uh, wax to create this uh, illusion. So and cover the whole um, dentin surface with uh, enamel and um, again, just adding some whitish effects on the surface. So if you add effects on the surface, you can easily modify them um, because if you put, put something internally, it's much harder to modify, obviously. So uh, that's why I like to, when I'm not sure about different effects, I like to add to the surface. So now I wanna show you the ceramic layering. So here's the framework. Um, I'm use, I, I use an Imexpress LTBL free framework. So I, nowadays, I think 90% of my cases, I'm using this um, Imexpress framework. I like the, the brightness, but also I like it still have some chroma. So uh, before I used MO0, which was totally white. And with that one, I had to spend more time to uh, adding more chroma to the, the framework. So I found with LTBR free, it's um, a little bit quicker. So what I recommend, especially with veneer restorations, when you have a really limited room is to hollow out the framework uh, close to the, the margin area, because then you have more room for the layering. Otherwise you probably build out too far in the framework and uh, it's gonna be too thick and the emergence profile uh, will, uh, will be a little bit um, unfishing or not correct in the mouth. Okay, so here's the, the framework on the left side and with uh, the sprinkle layer. So the wax uh, on the, this central is ready. So I do the, uh, the ceramic buildup. So the first two layers are similar to the wax. So here in this area, I use the power dent in bleach four and I'm added white stain to increase the, the opacity. So power dentin is much more opaque and um, if, even if it's not more opaque, but it's more um, higher in value and brighter than the old uh, or the traditional dentin in the kit. I still find something, sometimes I have to add uh, stains to imp, uh, increase the, the opacity and the value. So that's why I used white stain uh, into the power dentin in this area. So remember, this is a high value area. And then I use the, the normal uh, bleach for dentin uh, for this uh, incisal part to create uh, the memelons. So the next step is, um, it's many, many buildups here, so I don't have time to um, show every details here, but uh, with the blue, I built up the similar bluish translucency, this uh, warmer color, what you see, this orange, this, these are the memelons. Uh, the violet here is similar, what I used for the, the wax, so this absorption area. So normally I'm using SIG, so the special in size of gray in the Emax kit. I like to use that one, it's, it's a nice material, but you have to be careful, so don't use too thick because um, it can be um, too strong. I also use some whitish um, enamel mixture. Um, in this case, I use Opal Effect Free and then Tim Bleach one mixed half and half. So just to increase some uh, brightness in the line angles and in some areas of the, uh, 
teeth or of the restoration. So remove from the model and adding some uh, power dentin for the proximal and the, and for the halo effect. So that's what you see you see here this green um, layer. So this is my firing program for the the dentin, and I use I'm using the same firing program for the first fire and the second fire. And uh, you find uh, my firing programs. I uploaded these photographs to my website, so you can visit there and uh, you can download from there. So this is the first fire, and this is the stage when I'm sending my cases for uh, trying. So we can test if my layering is correct or not, and I can easily change um, my layering if something is, uh, has to be changed. Okay, so it's a little bit longer because you have to compensate for the shrinkage, so ceramic is um, always shrinking. So the final layer, usually I'm using power size on enamels, I like those enamels. And um, so you can see here, I used uh, a power dentin for the halo. Okay, so remove the dies, I fired. So this is the firing and you can see nicely coming through the, the internal effects inside uh, uh, the ceramic work. So this is the second fire. I use the same firing program for the second fire. So now um, I'd like to show you how to create the textures in a wax and in a ceramic. So these are the tools I like to use for um, my wax uh, texture and, and the wax apps. Um, so usually I'm using uh, these two, so this um, rounded uh, wax tool uh, or carving tool and this more pointy. Um, so this is the, the Ramford Ego Wax Knives uh, number two and number three. So on the left side you see a video, uh, it's a speed up video, so I'm not that uh, fast when I do um, a carving, but you can see I'm using this bigger size uh, wax knife to, um, to finalize the shape. Uh, the buckle shape of the uh, the wax up and then I'm using a smaller um, size and create first the, uh, the vertical restoration a uh, vertical texture so I'm always starting with a vertical um, texture and then I go for the the horizontal so these are the horizontal texture basically imitating the the perichiamatas and also soften all the details uh, and all the sharp edges uh, in the vertical uh, um, texture and vertical grooves. So see, this is after um, you know the vertical and horizontal carving. So you can see it's already starts um, looking uh, pretty close to what we want to achieve. So again, I'm using the number two um, carving tool for creating the vertical texture, and using the number three for um, smooth the vertical texture and also create the horizontal uh, details. So here are the results, and so when, when you polish up the wax, uh, with a, you can use a wet tissue paper or you can use a, a nylon stocking. So with that one, you can nicely polish up and, and create some nicely uh, imitating like a ceramic uh, texture. So um, yeah, it's really up to you. You know, this shine is really quickly uh, disappears when you touch the wax, but uh, you can experience with that one. And it's, again, it's a really good, uh, way to learn how to create a uh, natural um, appearance and natural texture because when you're polishing your ceramic restoration you basically do the same kind of polishing. Okay, so for uh, ceramic I like to use uh, diamond burrs and these are um, I mostly use um, and I like to start with these ball shaped um, diamonds and you can see that the shapes are quite similar uh, to the ceramic or the, the wax carving tools. So I like to use similar size for, um, for both because then it's basically the same kind of um, um, movements I, I do for creating the texture. So first I starting with a, with a bigger one, again, similar to the wax, just smooth out the whole surface and then uh, continue with a, a, a smaller sizes and first creating the vertical uh, texture on, on a buckle surface and then um, uh, the next one is with the horizontal with a smaller size and so you can nicely uh, smooth out uh, the, um, the sharp edges of the vertical um, textures. So here's um, after texturing and I applied a, a really thin layer of uh, stain liquid. So with that one you can see better 
the reflections and you can judge um, your texture better. Uh, but I, I highly recommend to use a really thin layer of uh, stain liquid because if you put too much liquid on the surface, that's uh, basically fill up the, all the details on the surface. So it's much harder to see nicely. So just a really thin layer. And you can add, uh, you can do some extra modification or you can start to polish. So I always like to polish up um, the surface before uh, the stain and glaze firing. So it's not removing too much details, but especially when um, the, where are the line angles and the higher points on the surface, I like to smooth out with some uh, rubbers because then the, the firing result is much um, closer to what I want. So first uh, I use this uh, soft rubber. Um, this is from Ramford again, and it's nice because it's not too ab um, abrasive, so it's not removing too much details. And for the, the cervical area, I like to use this from Yota. And with this one, you want to make sure that your transition from the framework to the layering is really nice and smooth, because otherwise um, you have these steps and that's not really good for the tissue. So you have to be sure that uh, the margin is nice and smooth for the, uh, uh, the gingiva. So after the polishing, I'm still sometimes using a, a fine diamond to uh, create some extra details, fine details, and usually using um, a microscope for this one. Um, and under the microscope, like 10 times magnification, you can see really nicely the, the fine details you, you create. And then I do the glaze. I use a, a glaze uh, powder and mix it with a, um, a stain liquid. So it depends on the case and depends on the um, the shine and the luster you want to achieve with the restoration. Sometimes I, I'm not using any kind of glaze, but sometimes I apply. Obviously, if you're using um, a glaze powder and a glaze paste, the, the end result is much um, shiny and much smoother on the surface. So what you see on the right side is um, uh, those areas where, uh, where it's not perfectly smooth. I'm applying some ivocolor uh, glaze, again, to have a nice uh, surface for the tissue because the tissue is prefer a nice and clean and a highly polished uh, cervical and ceramic. Uh, you can also use the ivocolor cream to correct the um, uh, contact points. So if you don't have, um, you know, a tight enough contact area, you can use the glaze or the cream to create those um, additions. And also what I uh, realized that my uh, distal corner was a little bit short, so that's why I added some power dentin and add-on mixture at the stain firing. And with that one, I can uh, increase the, the length there. So this is after the, the glaze fire. So you can see um, the shine, the luster is, is looks pretty good, but you can still improve uh, this one with uh, some polishing uh, because uh, when you see the surface of the ceramic under uh, magnification, like under a microscope, you can see it's not perfectly smooth. So you have some small positives on the surface. You can polish out uh, with this uh, Yota uh, rubber, and then you have a much more natural uh, looking restoration. Okay, and um, so the final stage to compare wax and ceramic. So here's a video about, um, you know, on the, um, our left side, you can see the wax and on the right side, you can see the ceramic. Obviously the, the shine and the luster of the ceramic is always um, higher because it's really hard to polish up the wax because the wax is really soft uh, compared to the ceramic. But I think if you're using this wax kit or um, uh, just one color dentin wax, um, you can learn a, lo a lot about um, morphology and texture and you can easily use this one to train someone. So if you have an apprentice in your lab or uh, if you want to learn about uh, layering, I think wax is excellent tool. It's much quicker than uh, ceramic and also much uh, cheaper. So again, so you can see ceramic has higher uh, translucency. You can create these fine cracks. So uh, my wax compared to the, the ceramic looks quite um, simple. So, but obviously there you have, um, you know, different materials, so they have different translucencies as well. 
So again, side by side, uh, the wax and the ceramic. So uh, I really like um, to use wax to, to learn and test different layerings. And I highly recommend to use uh, photography, so not just for shade communication and uh, patient communication, but also uh, cameras, your best teacher. So I started to take photographs um, 15, 20 years ago. And, you know, when you see your uh, images on the screen, uh, the magnification is almost like 10 times magnification. So you see all the problems. So there is two way you stop taking photographs or you fix your restorations and you improve yourself. So I highly um, recommend everyone to, to invest your camera and, uh, and learn about nature and uh, learn about your, your work because with photographs you can, you can see all the problems as well. But when you have a nice result, uh, you can be really proud and um, you, know, you can print and you can put on your wall. So thank you again for uh, watching and thank you for your attention. And I really appreciate that uh, Ranford asked me to uh, give this lecture. Um, so if you have any questions, you can find on uh, these links so on my website or Instagram and Facebook. And I'm always really happy to help and uh, answer the question. And hopefully this presentation was useful for you. Thank you so much. Uh Shami, what can I say? Thank you very much for this very excellent presentation. And also, uh, I love your photographs, uh, really nice. It was very interesting. Also, this between wax to learning and also all steps in ceramic, I think this will help many beginners and also experienced and technician. Thank you again. Thank you so uh, much. My pleasure. And, and we look forward to have another nice presentation and also um, blind rested, uh, try to uh, follow a course also with Shabi Hunt as a uh, dental ceramist, also as a photographer. I had also the possibility to, to saw how he uh, explained photographs and everything and life is a, a daily learning. Okay, uh, you all, to you all participants, thank you very much. Uh, also follow our post at the Renford Expert Webinar Series on our website, Renford Dental and or in our social media channels like Facebook. Next week, we offer another interesting webinar with um, Matteo Moro from Wellington, New Zealand. And this is a topic about ceramic fragments of in contact lens veneers. This will be Wednesday next week. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Xavi. And we will see, see, you, see you soon. And I'll call you later. OK, thank you very right. much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you all. And have a nice evening or afternoon. <laughs>